Go with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 62. Psalm 62. We've been on a series focusing on our rule of life, and throughout this series, we are exploring the framework of practices that hold us together as a church. And uh, every week, we are trying to slowly build our rule of life together uh, in the areas of prayer, rest, relationships, and, and work. Thank you, gentlemen. And the, the, those four areas of prayer, rest, relationships, and work speak to four different dimensions in our relationship with God and how we are to worship God and live out this call to follow Jesus in the world. And so the prayer aspect is about the movement upward. The rest aspect is the movement inward. The relationship aspect is the movement withward. And the work aspect is the movement outward. And so it's upward, it's inward. It's withward, it's outward. And today we're going to focus on the inward part of rest, what it means to rest. Now, a rule of life is a structure or a rhythm that we've been talking about here that helps us to pay attention to God in everything that we do, a structure or a rhythm. And as we've been saying, the word rule in typical church settings, when you hear rule, we don't like the word rule because it brings about what you can and what you cannot do. But the word rule is the Latin word for trellis. And a trellis is a structure that a vine attaches itself to, to help it grow upward and outward. For a grapevine, it helps it to, grow, to bear much fruit. That if a grapevine did not have a structure to attach itself to, it would remain on the ground. It would not grow up. It would not grow out. It would not bear fruit. And so a, a trellis is about how do we attach ourselves to a structure or a rhythm of practices that enabled us to pay attention to God and everything that we do. And so we'll focus on uh, Psalm 62 and the dimension of rest. And David gives us some good words. Uh, what does it mean for us to rest in a world of restlessness? And so Psalm 62, beginning in verse 1. Let's actually, let's, let's pray this out uh, together. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Lord Jesus, may we live into that reality today. May they not just be words on a screen. May they be realities in our hearts that we truly live out. May we experience the depth of rest that only you can offer us, Lord. And so we offer our time to you. Open our eyes, open our ears, open up our hearts, Lord, to receive every gift of the Holy Spirit this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're talking about rest today, and the reality is our society is a very restless society. There's a lot of restlessness happening in our world. A lot of restlessness, I imagine, happening in this room, happening in our homes. I read an article published by the CDC, not the Community Development Corporation, but the Center for Disease and Public Health uh, uh, Control Prevention, Disease Control and Prevention. And the title of the article was called, Insufficient Sleep is a Public Health Problem. Insufficient Sleep is a Public Health Problem. And in the article, it's, it connected uh, the, 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 the motor vehicle crashes and the industrial disasters and the medical and occupational errors to the lack of sleep that people get. The article also said, and we know this to be true in our own experience, that people experiencing uh, sleep insufficiency are also more likely to suffer from chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, depression, and obesity as well as from cancer, increased mortality, and reduced quality of life and productivity. The CDC says that one out of three people do not get the rest they need each night, that a third of us in this room, 33% of us in this room, one out of every three people are not getting the kind of sleep that we need on a given basis. And all of us have experienced this at one point or another in our lives. We know what it's like to work long hours, because maybe the nature of your profession. For some of us, we work multiple jobs to put food on the table and to pay bills, tired, restless. For some of us, we work long hours because we are addicted to our work. And as a result, 
We are tired. As a result, we are sleep deprived. And what we all have in common, no matter what our country of origin, no matter our level of education, no matter the family we grew up in, no matter our job, all of us have this in common. We need sleep. And more than just sleep, we need rest. Because it's quite possible to sleep a lot and not have the rest for our souls. And many of us know what it's like not just to be without sleep. Most of us know what it's like to be without rest. The restlessness we feel is often not about the long hours of work. The restlessness we feel is often about our struggle with, uh, uh, with worry. The restlessness we feel is not about how much time we punch in and punch out. The restlessness we feel is about living our lives trying to get the approval of other people. We know what it's like to feel restless. And so to talk about rest in any meaningful way is to first locate the source of rest and to locate the source of our restlessness. And what we're going to find out in this passage and be reminded of is that God wants you to be at rest. Now, when I talk about rest, I'm talking about it very specifically in this way, that rest is a quality of life that enables us to live, here's the phrase, at ease, in confident trust in God. It's the quality of life that enables us to live at ease in confident trust. Trust in God. Now, from the onset, when I talk about rest, when I talk about sleep and all of that, I don't want to be overly simplistic here. Because whenever I talk about sleep and rest, some of us in the room, you might give me a a side eye or might scoff at that. Because the way your life is situated as it stands right now, you can't even think about rest. You can't even think about sleep. I think about parents of small children. And you're wondering, rest, where am I going to get that from? Sleep, how am I going to find that? My brother, I became an, an, an uncle again a couple of weeks ago. My brother and my sister-in-law had their, their beautiful uh, daughter, Jada, and, and, and he's texting me every day how much he's not sleeping. And so if he, if he were here today listening to this message, he'd say, rest, sleep, that's a dream. For some of us, you've worked multiple jobs, and you're thinking, rest, sleep, where am I going to get that? For some of you, you're caring for aging parents, and it seems like it's around-the-clock care, and you're wondering, rest, sleep, where am I going to get that from? And yet, with all of the, uh, the, the, the realities of life and the responsibilities of life, God wants to put you at rest. Now, when we talk about rest or restlessness, there are really two kinds of restlessness. The first restlessness is common to every person. It is situational restlessness. And that is from time to time, you experience a a form of restlessness because of, of a situation. Maybe you have to give a presentation at your job. You're feeling restless about that. You need to have a hard conversation with someone. You're feeling restless about that. You're going to the doctor's office and you're a bit concerned about something. You're feeling restless about that. That is situational restlessness. Now, that's normal. That's that's what reality is. Life comes and we have situational restlessness. It's part of the normal experience of being human. And there's nothing really we can do about that. There's just, we're, we're restless. But there's another kind of restlessness that God wants to deal with in our hearts, and it's soul restlessness. There's situational restlessness, and then there's soul restlessness. And God wants to address the deep soul, the, rest, the, the restlessness beneath the restlessness that only God can address. And so David shows us in Psalm 62 what it means to live a life of rest in midst of a culture of restlessness. And so as I preach this message and as we look to this chapter today, I want you to begin to name what you're restless about. What are you restless about today? Are you restless about your finances, restless about a housing situation, restless about a conflict that you have with someone, restless about dreams and goals not being fulfilled, restless about a particular timeline that you have for yourself that has not been realized? What are you restless about? We all carry this kind of restlessness. And as we hear David preach to us today in Psalm 62, God wants to begin to address the restlessness beneath the restlessness that God wants to, and God wants to set us at ease. In Psalm 62, David gives us words on rest. 
And we don't know what caused David to write this. Maybe David had a long day at the job running to the kingdom. Maybe David is coming out of a time of battle. Maybe David has just some administrative tasks and he has a lot on his mind, a day of physical labor. But whatever the reason for it, David takes out his pen, he takes out his scroll, and he begins to write a song about rest that only God can give. And this is what David says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. David begins by making a declaration that his soul finds rest in God. His salvation comes from him. And now David in verse 5, he begins from making a declaration to now talking to himself, preaching to himself. In verse 5, he says, yes, my soul, find rest in God. He's talking to himself. And sometimes you need to talk to yourself. Remind yourself. Preach to yourself. You say, well, I didn't get a seminary degree. doesn't matter. Sometimes you need to preach to yourself. Soul, trust in God. Whenever I run, as I mentioned, every three years or so, whenever I run and I get to like the third mile or what have you, I got to start talking to myself. Rich, stay with it. Another mile. You can do it. There's nobody here to preach to me. Sometimes you need to preach to yourself. And David starts preaching to himself. Soul, find rest in God. Now, we can't see some wonderful things in the English translation, but I want to show you some things in the literal Hebrew translation. Because the, the ways that David actually wrote this originally bring out some truth that we cannot see in the English translation. It was Dr. Robert Alter, who is a professor of Hebrew at, uh, at uh, California, University of California, Berkeley, where he talks about the, uh, the way to translate this that would be more uh, consistent with the original Hebrew. And what Alter does in the translation of Psalm 62 is he shows us that there's a particular Hebrew word that David begins four verses with, attributing these verses to God four times. And the word in Hebrew translates in English to only, only. And it begins four verses in chapter 62. And Robert Alter translates it in this way. David says, only in God is my soul quiet. From him is my rescue. Again, emphatically, only he is my rock and my rescue. I shall not stumble at all. Again, emphatically, only in God be quiet my soul, for from him is my hope. Again, emphatically, only he is my rock and my rescue, my fortress, I shall not stumble. David is not saying that God is one of many different sources of rest. He's saying there's only one source of rest, and it is only found in God, if you are tired, if you are hungry, if you are thirsty, if you are weary, if you are burdened, there's only one place to go. Only in God is my soul quiet. And David lets us know what you are looking for can only be found in one place. One place only. Listen, there are certain things that you can find anywhere. Coffee, find that anywhere. Pizza, find that anywhere within New York City. I don't trust anybody else outside New York City. (laughs) Good slice of pizza, you can find it anywhere in New York. But there are certain things that can only be found in one place. You want to see the Mona Lisa painting? I've seen some of the counterfeits and all that there. There's only one place. You got to go to France. Only there you can see it. The other day, I was looking for a particular book to buy. I couldn't find the book. I finally found the website, and it said, only sold here for like $89 for this little book. Only sold here. David says, there's only one place I need to go, and one place where my soul will find its rest. It's only found in God. Amen? Only found in God. Now, David needs to say this. Because he knows that there are many temptations for us to find rest in different places. To find, to make our soul be at a place where only God can get. We are tempted to find it in different places. So in verse 10, David begins to name some things. He says, do not trust in extortion. 
or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. In other words, David is saying in this passage here, the riches of the world, the power of the world, don't have any illusions about these things. They can't give you the rest you need. And this is not an exhaustive list. David is saying that relationship you're hoping for is not going to give you the rest you need. The job you're hoping for, as good as it is, is not going to give you the rest you need. The house you're looking for, the, 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 the car you're looking for, the job you're looking for, all wonderful things. But they're not going to give you the rest you need. It's only found in one place. It's only found in God. David is saying, don't trust in false sources of rest. Only rest is found in God. Now, we need to hold on to this, and we need to let David preach to us, because we live in a restless culture, and the rest I'm referring to is deeper than the hours of sleep that we get on a given night. I'm talking about an interior restlessness that permeates our souls, that permeates our cities. There's a restlessness that we all experience from time to time to try to prove ourselves to others, and we can never rest because we have to prove ourselves. To a parent, prove ourselves. To an employer, prove ourselves. To a friend, prove ourselves to someone else. And some of us can live very restless lives trying to prove ourselves to other people. We can be restless in our attempts to possess what other people have. And that we have a hard time being content with what we have, that it's never enough. And so we are restless people. We are the young and the restless. The old and the restless. We are restless across the board. At what point do we, do we get to say, I have enough? At what point do we say, I've done enough? At what point do we say, I am enough? The reality is we live our entire lives as restless people, always seeking the next thing to secure the rest that only God can give. Henry Nouwen phrased it this way, our restlessness is often attributed to what he calls a kind of destination disease. That we, it's a disease that says, when I get to the next destination, then my soul will be at rest. But as, as Ken Shigematsu said yesterday, last week, the goalpost keeps moving. And so you find rest in a place, and then you got to find rest in something else. It's a destination disease. And David says there's only one place where rest can truly be found. It's found in God. And when you're able to trust in his love, our souls are at rest. And so David says in verse 11, he says, One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. The rest our souls need is only found in God's love. It's only found in God's love. And David wants us to trust in this love because he knows that there is a direct correlation with our level of trust and our level of rest. There is a direct correlation with our level of trust and our level of rest. We experience this on many levels. If you don't trust the person you're dating, if you don't trust the person you're married to, you could be certain there's no rest when they leave your sight. If you don't trust them every time the phone rings, every time there's a text message, if you don't trust them, there is no rest. We know this in relationships. We know this at the barbershop or the beauty salon. If you don't trust a person who is doing your due and and, and working with your hair, you can't rest. Just a couple of days ago, I called my barber. I said, I'm coming over. He said, I'm not there. I said, where are you at? He said, I'll be away for a few days. I said, I need a haircut. I'm not there. And so I had to find someplace else. Now, I love my barber. When I, when I go to my barber, he has a, a way of concealing some thinning areas, first of all. He, he's, a, he's a magician. <laughs> he's a miracle worker. 
I come out there really confident, like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> when my barber is cutting my hair, I fall asleep in the chair. I know, do what you got to do, brother. I, I, I'm just going to take a nap. Because where there's trust, there's rest. But I had to find another barber this week. And I found that I sat down, and already I was a little bit nervous because everybody was cutting hair except him. <laughs> and whenever the barbershop is full and there's only one guy who said, come on, come, come, come on, come on, like, watch that person. Just watch, be mindful of that person. As I could tell, he hasn't been with someone all day, but he's, he's wiping the seat like there's hair on it. Come on, come over here. Hey, you haven't seen anyone, brother. Why? He's like, come on, sit down. And so I sit down, and every 30 seconds, I want to see what you're doing. Let me see it. Let me see it. I got to look at it. Let me see. Let me see. I couldn't rest. I couldn't take a nap. Because where there's no rest, no trust, there is no rest. If you have a child, then... You, you, you want them to be babysat. You want to go out, but you don't trust fully the babysitter. You're not going to be at rest. When you fly in an airplane, there's, there is, there, the pilot knows how to build trust in a way that you can be at rest. I had a flight earlier this week, and on the way over to my destination, the pilot said from the very beginning, there's going to be, in a very soothing, calm confident voice. Guys, there's going to be some turbulence. Don't worry about it. We're going to get at 30,000 feet. We'll get you to your destination. Just be mindful of it. I was just, okay, thank, thank you for the heads up. I, I trust this guy. And so, and, so, and so when the plane was doing all this there, I mean, I was a bit, ah, but, but, but I trust him. I, I'm okay because, because he, I can trust this guy so I can be at rest. On the way back, the pilot had no decency <laughs> to let me know there was going to be turbulence. And so all of a sudden, the plane is doing all this here, and I'm holding on for dear life. I don't trust the pilot now. And now I'm restless because the, our degree of trust speaks to the degree of rest that we experience. And David is saying in Psalm 62, God can be trusted. You can trust in his love. You can trust in his goodness. You can trust in his faithfulness. You can trust in his compassion. You can trust in his love. You can trust in his love. Amen. And yet, we say we trust, and we live another reality. There's a theologian, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, a man by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar. And Balthazar writes these words that have really struck my heart. And he says, how can a person seriously believe that God is love and has given himself up for us on the cross because he has loved us and chosen us from all eternity and has predestined us for an eternity of bliss in his presence? How can anyone seriously believe this to be true? And at the same time, refuse to love God in return or despair of God's love. What he's saying is, it's one thing to, to think it. It's another thing to trust it. And when you trust that God has given himself up for us in Jesus, what else could he give but his son to demonstrate his love for you and for the world? And he says, if you can believe that God has given his son, how can you despair of that love? David is preaching to us in Psalm 62, trust in the love of God, that God is for you, not against you, that he is with you, not apart from you. And as we trust in his love, our souls can be at rest. This is what Jesus shows us in the way he lives in the world, that Jesus is not just our rest. He shows us how to rest. In the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus on a boat with his disciples and a storm comes, and it's a crazy storm. And Mark, the gospel writer, shows us and reminds us that Jesus is sleeping in the boat. The only time in the Bible where Jesus is seen as sleeping is in this passage. There's no other time in the Bible where it says Jesus is sleeping. The only time he's sleeping is in a storm. 
And the disciples come to him and they, they shake him. Lord, don't you care for us? Don't you care? Gonna, we're going to die. And Jesus stands up and he, he rebukes the wind. He rebukes the waves. And then he says, have you no faith? And what he's saying is, listen, he, he's showing us you can trust in the Father's love. The reason Jesus is able to sleep in the middle of a storm is because he's trusting the Father's love. Now, when you compare the disciples sleeping, the only time the disciples are sleeping is they're sleeping because of anxiety and fear. When they're sleeping, it's by the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying and his disciples are sleeping. They know what's coming. And it's almost as if they're medicating themselves. I, gotta go, I don't want to face reality. When the disciples sleep, is out of anxiety. When Jesus sleeps, is out of trust. And Jesus wants to let you know you can trust in the love of God. And David reminds us we can trust in the love of God. To rest doesn't mean that storms don't come our way. To rest doesn't mean that life doesn't get difficult. To rest doesn't mean that we live in denial. But rest is about trusting in the God who cares for us in the midst of our disorientation. And so again, rest is this quality of our interior life that enables us to live at ease in confident trust in God. And the degree of our trust will be the degree of our rest. And so we gather on Sunday morning and we sing songs and we hear the, the word preached and we gather to take bread and dip it in a cup. We gather to pray with one another to be reminded, I know it's uh, Monday through Saturday can be all hell breaking loose in your life. And we're reminded on Sunday morning, every Sunday we need to gather to say, God can be trusted. That God is for you. That God is not against you. Our souls find rest in God's love. But for the rest of our time, what I want to now do is talk about how our souls are nurtured in that. And so to say it this way, the rest our souls need is found in God's love. And our souls are nurtured through practices of rest. And so it's one thing to say, I trust in the love of God and to receive that. But how do you nurture that now? How do you make rest a part of your life on the interior and on the exterior? How do we live restful lives out of which we work? Restful lives out of which we love? Restful lives out of which we bear witness to Jesus. It is at this point where we get again to our rule of life. Because our rule of life is a structure. It's a trellis. It's a rhythm that our lives attach itself to. To help us grow outward and upward to bear fruit. And there are particular practices in our church rule of life. In our community rule of life. That are to nurture our souls for the sake of rest. I want to talk about four different practices, four different commitments that we are invited into to, to, to nurture our souls for rest. Only Jesus Christ can give us the rest our souls desperately need, but it is out of that place that we nurture that rest through practices of rest. And the four I want to outline to you, the, the, the first one is one we've heard of on a regular basis. It's Sabbath keeping, and it bears repeating. For some of us, this is new. For some of us, this is old. For all of us, this is necessary. That we need a regular rhythm for our lives to rest. And the reason we do it is twofold. In the book of Genesis and in, the, in, in Exodus, there are two reasons why we see God resting on the Sabbath. God creates for six days, and then on the seventh day, he rests. And in Exodus, it says that the reason we are to rest is because God did it. In other words, when we rest, we are imitating God. It's an act of imitation. God works for six days, rests on the seventh. And when we rest for a 24-hour period, we are imitating God. Sabbath is, an, is, a, is a practice of imitation. But then in Deuteronomy 5, you see there's another reason why we are to rest. 
In Deuteronomy 5, the word Deuteronomy means the second law, the second giving of the law. There's a new generation who's been in the wilderness. They're about to enter into the promised land. Moses says, we got to go over some things again. So I'm going to give you the law a second time. That's what Deuteronomy means. And so he gives them the law a second time and reminds them to keep the Sabbath. But in this case, the reason why they are to keep the Sabbath is not because of imitation. It's because of liberation. Moses says, the reason we are to keep Sabbath is because it is only slaves who don't rest. And if you can't rest, you're a slave. But God has liberated us from the power of Pharaoh, liberated us from the power of 24-7, nonstop working, liberated us from the inner Pharaoh that dominates our lives. And so Sabbath in this respect is a 24-hour period, not just of imitation, it's a 24-hour period of liberation, where we say we have found our freedom in God and God alone. And so Sabbath, very simply, is a 24-hour period with no have-tos or shoulds, which is to result in deep rest and renewal. A 24-hour, literal, not metaphorical, a literal period where we are to, without no have-tos, no shoulds, which is to result in deep rest and renewal. When we talk about keeping Sabbath, we're not just saying resting from making things. We're saying resting from trying to make something of yourself. That there's no need to prove yourself. The Sabbath is one of the greatest signs of the gospel. You do absolutely nothing, and God loves you. You don't achieve anything, and God loves you. You don't perform, and God loves you. What a picture of the gospel. And for 24 hours, on a week-in and week-out basis, our souls get the rest it needs. Now, we've talked on many occasions about the Sabbath, and we've mentioned that there are different rhythms. There is a secular rhythm, and then there's a Sabbath rhythm, a, a sacred rhythm. And the secular rhythm looks like this. It's work, 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 and then vacation. And that's many of our lives. It's nonstop work, and then we look forward to the summertime where we can have a little bit of vacation, and then we have a vacation, we're stressed out because of the vacation, and then we go back into work. And our lives are never lived with that kind of restfulness, joyfulness, centeredness. But what we need is a different kind of rhythm, a sacred kind of rhythm, in which there is an interplay of work and Sabbath, work and Sabbath. And so some of us say, I, I need a vacation. No, you need a Sabbath. You, you, you need a weekly rhythm where you can stop, where you can rest, where you can delight, where you can contemplate. In Genesis 1, it says, when God, when God created the Sabbath, the Hebrew word there is, is God exhaled. <sighs> When's the last time you've exhaled and said, I'll come back to that later? When's the last time you said, I, I don't have to prove myself any longer? I'm taking a break. I love watching the Food Network. I, I, I mentioned my favorite, one of my favorite images after an hour of someone cooking. And the timer goes up. Their hands have to go right in the air. And you cannot touch the food any longer. You say, oh, I, I need to put a little bit of garnish on it. You can't touch it. Hands in the air. And wave them like you just don't. Hey, just hand. You can't <laughs> touch the food. A Sabbath is, I've done all I could to make this meal. I've worked as hard as I can, but now there comes a time where I just have to say, I have to put my hands in the air. I, 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 I got to stop making things. And more than that, I have to try to stop making something of myself and trusting in the love of God. And so a, a soul practice is Sabbath. And we are invited to live this kind of of life, to rest from our perfectionism, from, to rest from our non-stack activity, to rest from the way of saying and living that says you are what you do. And so our, as, our, as a church congregation, my hope is that Sabbath is not just something that people do in pockets here and there around the city, but that we do it as a community together, that whether you live in Long Island or Queens or whether you live in Manhattan or Brooklyn or wherever you're coming from, 
that there's pockets of people in our city who are keeping Sabbath. And so as a church, a couple of years ago, we, we invited people, and this is a, a new invitation to say, keep the Sabbath together. That whether it's Saturday evening to 6 p.m. or sun, to, to Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and worship becomes a part of the Sabbath day, or whether it's Friday night to Saturday night, that we are invited together, whether you share meals with one another or whether you're doing it independently for a weekend or for a day, we are invited to hold Sabbath together. And may, may we be a community marked by rest, deep, abiding rest. That's the first practice. The second practice is the practice of self-care. The way towards rest is to receive the love of God, and it is out of that place of receiving the love of God that we take the time to do self-care. That was the Quaker author Parker Palmer who said that self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the, the only gift I've been put on earth for, and you are that gift. Self-care is never selfish. Self-care is good stewardship of my body, good stewardship of my soul, good stewardship of my mind. And so the question we need to ask ourselves on a regular basis is what are the things that nourish my soul? What are the things that energize my body? What are the things that fill me with joy? We can get so fixated on work that we never ask the question. And our souls are withering, but we are invited to a life of self-care. Self-care is never selfish. It is good stewardship of the gift I've been put on earth to offer others. We need practices of rest that help us to embrace our limits. On a given week and on a given month, a given year, one of the questions I continuously ask myself as I try to follow Jesus and be faithful to him is what are the things that Jesus is calling me to say no to? And what are the things he's calling me to say yes to? In other words, I can't do it all even though I want to do it all. But in this particular season of my life, what do I have to say no to? And what do I have to say yes to? To embrace our limits is not about laziness. To embrace our limits is about discerning God's will for this season of life. And it means I have to say no, and it means I have to say yes. And we all know that whenever we go beyond our limits, our souls are in danger whether they're financial limits, whether they are physical limits, time limits, whatever it is, we are invited to embrace our limits. Fourthly and finally, to live a life of rest means that we make space as well for play and recreation. To live a life of rest means we make space for play and recreation. And here's a sad part, about, sad reality about us adults. The older we get, the more delight deficient we become. Play deficient we become. I think this is one of the reasons why Jesus says, in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to become like a child. Because children know how to play. And children reflect a playful God, that God is playful. You doubt that? Look at creation for a moment. Look at a giraffe, the platypus. Look at the different animals that God creates. You, God has a wonderful sense of humor. God is playful. And if we're going to live a deep spirituality, we must begin to take playing seriously. And when you take playing seriously, we refuse to take ourselves seriously. And if there's one thing Christians know how to do is to take ourselves seriously. <laughs> and we are invited to play. This is where children can disciple us and show us the way. Children can play. There's a gift for playing. There's no instruction manual they need to play. There's no training they need to play. They come out of, the, out, of, out of the womb ready to play. And, it doesn't, and they don't need a whole lot to play. Yesterday, I, Nathan, my four-year-old, said, Daddy, can you build me the train set that's in the closet? I said, uh, no. Uh, I said, <laughs> <laughs> 
after about the sixth time, I said, all right. And so I opened the closet. I, I take out this big Thomas the Train set, massive amount of pieces. And I'm putting it together. I, I mean, I'm, I'm working hard. I got the, the, the instruction manual. I'm putting it there. Where is E4? Where is E4? I'm, I'm going crazy. He's helping me. Really, he's not helping me. He's making my life more difficult by putting tracks where they don't belong. And so after I get the whole thing together, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. He goes, thank you, Daddy. I go, you're, you're welcome, son. Have a great time. Go to my room just to lay down, just like I'm exhausted. <laughs> he plays with the train set for one minute and finds the cardboard box that the train set was in and plays with the cardboard box instead. For 30 to 40 minutes, it was a car, it was a boat, it was all, I was upset. He went, what are you doing? No, no, go to the, no, no, daddy, I'm playing now with the box. It wasn't a good day in my house, yes, it wasn't a good day. And yet I realized, as a four-year-old, play, recreation, imagination. And the older we get, the more delight deficient we become, and yet we are invited not to take ourselves so seriously, but to play for recreation. The rest our souls need is only found in God's love, but our souls are nurtured through practices of rest. I just want to show my rule of life for a moment, and then I'll give you a moment, then we'll sing together, give you a moment to work on yours for a moment. My rule of life in the area of rest is actually pretty simple. Remember, there's four areas. is prayer, rest, relationships, and work. And for me, my rule is really comprised of four different things. I have weekly Sabbath from 6 p.m. Friday to 6 p.m. Saturday. Where my family, we gather together. We eat together. We, we celebrate that there's no more work to do. Karis is nine years old. She loves Fridays. She comes out of school saying, Daddy, it's Sabbath. I said, do you have homework? Yes, but it's the Sabbath. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I said, this, this, she is applying this theology really well. <laughs> and so as a family from 6 p.m. Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday, we're stopping, we're resting, we're delighting, we're contemplating. I have weekly basketball recreation. Now that it's getting colder, I might have to rethink this here, but I have weekly basketball recreation. We're on a given day of a week for about 30 to 40 minutes. I go to a local park, and I just shoot some hoops for my own joy. And if you follow me on Instagram, you'll notice that I post some of my basketball. I only post the, the shots I make, all right? So I, just, <laughs> so, I, so I don't post anything. I just show my highlights, right? And, but it's restful for my soul to have that kind of recreation, a social media fast for five to seven days a week or so, and listening to music. Every day, I need to listen to some kind of music for the sake of my soul, for the sake of my joy, for the sake of rest. The rest our, our, our souls need are only found in God's love, but they're nurtured through practices of rest. The question is, what are the practices that you need? Out of receiving God's love, what are the practices that you need to nurture your soul? I want to invite the worship team to come forward. I want to give you a moment just to take out either your phone or to take out that insert in your bulletin. And I just want to give you a moment as the Holy Spirit is leading you to capture a practice. What, what does your soul need? And the goal in writing it down is for the sake of praying about it later, to wrestle with it later. What does your soul need for the purpose of rest? And maybe you see something on the screen right here, or maybe there's something else that you know. My soul comes alive when I'm doing this. My body feels replenished when I do this. Name that for a moment, and then we'll sing together.
Lord Jesus, our souls only find their rest in you. And on this Sunday morning, would we trust in your love, a love that is self-giving, sacrificial, compassionate, and merciful. Lord, you take on our sins on your body so that we could have rest with God and rest within ourselves. And so, Lord, may we receive this gift of rescue, this gift of love, and may we trust in your love, and may our souls find rest, and Lord, may our souls be nurtured by practices of rest. And so, Lord, we sing to you now words of praise, of gratitude, of thanksgiving. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, let's all stand, let's sing together.
Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Let's have our prayer team come to my left. Invite those who are offering the bread and the cup to come to my right. In a given week, all of us will experience some kind of situational restlessness. Something will happen. It will make your soul uneasy, fill you with anxiety and worry. And then many of us throughout the course of a week will experience the soul kind of restlessness. The restlessness that says, I'm never enough. I'll never have enough. I'll never do enough. I'll never be enough. And God wants to set you at peace and give you rest that the world can't give and the world can't take away. And so our prayer team is here for whatever anxiety, worry, concern, restlessness. And whether it's a situational restlessness, something happening this week and you just feel uneasy about it and you need the peace of God over you, our prayer team is here. Or whether you know it's a soul restlessness, something deeper beyond just a situation and you, and you need the love of God to set you at peace, our prayer team is here. Some of you, you're not even a Christian. You've never said yes to Jesus. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, whether you know it or not, your soul is restless. Because only Jesus Christ can give us the rest our souls need. And so feel free to come up for prayer for whatever restlessness you're experiencing today. And to my right, we have the bread and the cup where we are reminded of God's faithful love towards us, dying on a cross, broken and poured out for our sins that we may be reconciled to God, experiencing his peace and joy and love and hope. And when we take the bread and the cup, we're saying, Lord, may I root my life and find my rest in you and what you have done for me. And so whether you're coming for prayer, coming for the table, as the Spirit leads you, please respond. And as we close, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven. If you're watching online, feel free to open your hands in this way as well. We open our hands in this posture because this is a sign of receiving. And we cannot give what we have not received. And so with your hands in a posture of receiving and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, finding your soul at rest and at ease because of what God has done for you in Christ. And may you turn to him, turn from your ways, find yourself in his love. And may you offer that love and that joy and that rest to the world around you. May you be found in the love of God this week. And may that love lead you to repentance, to come back to the Father's love. And so I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Grace and peace to you all.